Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Kremers and I'd like to welcome you to today's TUM AI uh, lecture series. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Today we have a speaker from the West Coast again. Uh, this is Hao Li. Hao Li is CEO and co-founder of Pinscreen, a startup that is focused on cutting edge AI driven virtual avatar technologies. And since recently, he's also a distinguished fellow of the Computer Vision Group at UC Berkeley. He's been all over the place in his career. He's done many things, and it's very hard to list everything uh, before uh, becoming uh, a full screen at pin screen. He was associate professor uh, of computer science at the University of Southern California, as well as director of the Vision and Graphics Lab at, uh, at the USC Institute uh, for Creative Technologies. Uh, his work is very well known. He worked in this on the interface of computer graphics and computer vision, focusing on topics like digitizing humans, uh, performance capture, telepresence in virtual worlds, etc. And he's developed a number of impressive algorithms, both deep learning based, uh, data driven, but also geometry kind of classical geometry processing algorithms. He's known for seminal work in many fields like avatar creation, facial animation, etc. He worked in, in, as I said, a number of places. He worked as a visiting professor at Wita Digital, uh, Industrial Light and Magic, Lucas Films. He was also a postdoc fellow at Columbia and at Princeton University. He's gotten many awards, uh, including the top 35 innovator under 35 by MIT, MIT uh, Technology Review in 2013. And most recently, he, uh, was, uh, he got the ACM SIGGRAPH Real-Time Live Best in Show Award, in fact, last year. So it's a great pleasure for us to have him here with us today, Hao Li. The floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel, for the, uh, for the nice introduction. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, thanks everyone for um, joining my uh, presentation. Um, today, I'd like to talk about uh, some of our recent efforts and also motivate a little bit the work uh, that we're doing uh, for, you know, aiming, really aiming for the next couple of years, what we think, how, um, you know, the use of virtual humans is going to impact uh, society and also applications that we're going to use. Uh, so the <clears throat> title of my presentation is called AI Generated uh, Digital Humans. And what I mean with AI generated uh, means that there, there are two components here. The first one is how do we create digital humans, right? Traditionally, um, people would create digital humans using manual efforts or it would scan humans. And what we mean with AI generated is not necessarily, um, you know, just generating a new person, uh, but it's also how can we use recent developments in deep learning to facilitate a more robust way of digitizing humans. And the second part of AI generated means uh, how do we render them, right? How do we, are we going to use a traditional approach of computer graphics or is it better to use a neural approach for rendering humans? And one thing that I like to motivate a little bit in this presentation is this hybrid approach in order to uh, sort of like get the best of both worlds, at least in the short term uh, future. So to motivate a bit why we care so much about digital humans, um, I think there's nothing that's better to illustrate this uh, example uh, right now, you know, I guess everyone is familiar with uh, these kind of um, uh, scenarios. You know, I'm giving this talk via Zoom. Uh, we had some discussions a couple of minutes ago about, yeah, you know, it would be so great to have like high resolution, uh, you know, presentations and, you know, not being limited, constrained to this uh, 2D screen. Uh, it's always better to have the ability to meet in person. And uh, this is a discussion that many companies have. Uh, especially when, um, you know, you have lockdowns and, you know, people are thinking about that uh, because there are certain advantages there um, of working from home very often, you know, they've done some studies that there's a better work-life balance, but at the same time, you have the disadvantage that you're losing connection with your employer, your colleagues, 
And <clears throat> one, one of the things that you can't, and there are many tasks that you can't really perform, especially those that require spatial interaction, right? I want to collaborate on uh, explaining certain things um, and I need the, you know, a certain device. I need to be able to interact together as a group on something, right? So just think about like uh, people trying to explain certain machines, um, all these kind of things require people to collaborate spatially. So there are studies that are showing that this sort of like hybrid working between home and uh, workspace is going to stay even after this, um, um, <clears throat> this post COVID-19 world. And uh, we really have to think about how this world is going to look like in the future and how we can make it more effective. That's the same thing with, you know, virtual conferences, virtual meetings. Um, there's a lot of um, thoughts about how can we enhance this experience? How can we bring the physical experience into this online remote, you know, virtual setting in order to uh, facilitate what we could have done uh, physically, but still have the advantages of being remote. So I think this is a great um, video um, that was, um, you know, recently, uh, you know, presented by uh, Microsoft. So, um, you know, they're obviously launching HoloLens 2 and uh, is trying to make it a lot more mainstream. And um, one of the concept videos that you can see here really showcases you know, sort of like the key killer application, which is telepresence. How can we bring ourselves, you know, teleport ourselves virtually from one place to another? How can we facilitate work together and uh, social interactions? And one of the important things that you can see here is that you need to have your own visual representation in 3D. And this could be in different forms, right? One of the forms that you see here in the scene is you can see one is this uh, immediate capture of the person and streaming into this virtual world. And the other one is this avatar. And both have their pros and cons. And we're basically looking at both uh, side of things and we'll discuss them in detail. So six years ago, um, you know, when I was, uh, when I just started at uh, USC, um, <clears throat> Facebook, it was the time when Facebook, you know, acquired Oculus. And one of the big visions that they had was they wanted to make the world a more open and connected space. <clears throat> and chief scientist Michael Abrash, you know, they, he uh, came to visit USD, gave a presentation. And I asked him a question, which is, um, so what if, when people are wearing these VR heads, how are you going to animate the face, right? And one, you know, immediately uh, he, he, uh, <laughs> after the, his presentation came to visit our lab. And we started some uh, discussions around that and very quickly it turned into a uh, collaboration with um, back then Oculus, right? And one of the first thing that we developed and that we presented at SIGGRAPH was this sort of like prototype system that allows you to um, puppeteer an avatar in real time while the person is wearing a VR headset. And uh, you know you can see, right? So we're using a depth sensor to capture the mouth and there's some contact sensors on the foam pad to you know, sort of like track the eye region. So that was sort of like a very early design of just showing the capability of you know, driving an avatar in a virtual environment so that we can uh, enable things like remote communication in VR. You know, a year later, we very, quickly realized that wasn't the, the right form factor. So we started to experiment with inward facing cameras that are inside the VR headset and the use of smaller uh, cameras mounted to the VR headset in order to capture what the mouth is. One thing that was really interesting here in this project wasn't about the hardware, but it was really about how can we handle a wider range of subjects, a, um, larger variation of mouth expressions to map to an avatar. And that was one of the first work that we did where we didn't use conventional facial tracking algorithms, but we started to use deep neural networks in order to turn this problem into a simple mapping problem where we didn't have to formulate 
how to track mouth in a very constrained setting, but how can we just use data that we collected, use some uh, ground truth data in order to do this mapping implicitly, right? So an implicit way of solving a very difficult, very challenging problem. And that turned out to be, uh, you know, a very robust solution to this. Now, fast forward a couple of years, we can see some really exciting research that Facebook Reality Labs has been doing. Um, here is a work that was shown, I think, one or two years ago. Um, uh, it's called uh, Codec Avatars, right? So you probably have seen uh, these really, really compelling and photorealistic humans that are, you know, recorded inside this dome from multiple views. And uh, you can basically see how um, in real time, you can basically puppeteer your own character while wearing this VR headset. And they're using very similar technologies to capture mouth and, you know, eye, eye, uh, eye regions in order to find this mapping to generate an entire avatar. Um, if, you've, if you're following, uh, you know, what's happening, I think they're showcasing some uh, really cool stuff recently where even on an Oculus uh, Quest 2, you can do, uh, you know, real-time rendering, but you still need to capture the data of a specific person. Um, so making it accessible is still a challenge that needs to be uh, done. And I'll talk about that as well. So it's not only in VR, uh, also in the space of augmented reality, um, there are some companies that are working on how to facilitate things like social interactions and collaborations wearing an AR headset, such as the HoloLens. This is uh, <clears throat> work from spatial.io where they're using um, avatars that are digitized from people. You can see that it doesn't, still doesn't have the same level of fidelity as you can see uh, in the previous slide but uh, it's something that uh, really showcases the need for making it accessible to people. I've been showing a couple of examples that tries to bring people that are remote together, but it's not only that, right? It's also about how can we enable interaction with a uh, machine, right? So fully autonomous AI systems, um, there are some studies that are showing that 85% of all customer interactions with online services, companies are all going to be without human agents by 2021. And what is the best way to have interaction between a human uh, and a machine? It's to make it more natural. And the most natural interaction is with another human. This is the reason why you have things like Siri and Alexa. It's have, it has a human voice in it. So obviously, um, there are companies that are looking into how do we create virtual assistants, right? So here's an example from Soul Machine. How can we create um, a human-like interface to enable a more natural interaction between a human and a machine? And this is really just the first step, right? You shouldn't think of the, you know, the first step, you know, the, the stop, it stops with uh, Q and A. Uh, this is what, you know, uh, current AI systems can do, but it will go beyond that, right? We're going to have online lectures with you know, uh, autonomous uh, humans in the future, where you know we can, you know, we don't won't have the limitation of just having a playback video, but they'll be able to adjust to adapt to our needs. They'll be able to provide us real time feedback if we have questions. So this is really interesting because people are starting with you know what's available, which is conventional computer graphics, you know, really pushed at the limits, but also Here's an example from Samsung Neon, where they're starting to look into how can we use a different form of rendering, right? Can, can we have this video-based rendering where you have some form of, um, <clears throat> you know, interactive manipulation, similar to what you can see with things like deep things. And the use of virtual humans is not only benefiting um, communication or interaction with AI systems, but also has a potential impact for, you know, any life event industry, right? So everything has been shut down since the pandemic. And, uh, but there are, you know, um, potential for virtual events where, you know, everyone is talking about the metaverse. And, you know, a great example is this, you know, Travis Scott's uh, virtual concert that he threw inside of Fortnite, right? That you, you, 
he has the, the capability to reach out tens of millions of people and uh, in real time, right? So this is a different form of entertainment that I think is going to become more and more interesting because it goes beyond uh, physical uh, limitations. And as we, uh, you know, as, as we're mentioning about virtual uh, celebrities, um, there are also virtual celebrities that don't even exist, right? Such as Lil Michaela that are emerging on the internet and are getting, you know, more followers than uh, real humans in many instances, right? So this is really a new uh, form of capability that you can have with the use of virtual humans. So I've talked about like three key um, areas where virtual humans make a lot of sense and have not only make sense, but will have a very big impact, uh, especially when we try to um, predict a little bit what's going to happen in the future. One is in communication. Uh, if we ever want to go beyond 2D interaction, we need a 3D form of ourselves. Human machine interaction, if we want to have a more natural interaction with devices, um, you probably want to make it more human like. And uh, it doesn't replace necessarily what we have, but it's adding for many scenarios a more practical um, you know, uh, option. And the third thing is obviously in entertainment. So, and content creation. So, let's talk about CG humans. So, in computer graphics, people have been working very long um, you know, on how do we make very realistic humans. And many of you have heard of the problem of the uncanny valley effect, which is when you try to create something that looks like a real human, you have to get it completely right. Otherwise, you'll have this like repelling feeling of the virtual. Now, we've already seen and we're familiar with like perfect solutions in visual effects. Um, but obviously, there you have you know, huge teams of digital artists and experts and engineers behind it. And it takes months to generate a couple of seconds and even to render, you need um, very sophisticated, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, resources. Now, what we're looking at is really more into the real-time domain and also the ability to reduce the amount of cost and time to generate this type of content. Um, we have to mention uh, the recent advancement from uh, Epic Games. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen MetaHumans. So MetaHumans is a state-of-the-art um, solution for uh, rendering humans in real time and also for um, authoring um, you know, digital humans using a very, you know, the MetaHumans creator, which allows you to um, you know, sort of customize avatars very quickly, right? So you can still see it still has a little bit of a game-like look uh, in it. Um, but I think it's uh, a huge advancement over what you had in the past, especially in the past, they were showing a couple of, you know, specific humans, but here you have like this broader range of humans. And uh, it's really a very, it's, a, it's really a huge engineering effort where rendering, shaders, assets, all play an important role. Now, what we're trying to solve here is how do we bring ourselves into it? So you don't want to have this layer of another person, you know, authoring for hours to get uh, a specific look. And also to get the perfect look is still very difficult. So you need to have a computer vision approach to capture the person. So the perfect or the uh, ideal approach is you would, you know, you would basically scan a, perf a person with the best possible, uh, you know, capture setting. Um, at back at uh, USC ICT, we were dealing regularly with, you know, capturing celebrities and actors and bring them into uh, into movies. And one of the things that you know was really key was that we capture all the details of the person, all the uh, you know reflectance properties of the scans, all the physical properties, allowing us to render them inside a new virtual environment using uh, you know, state-of-the-art computer graphics. What is needed though, is this big machinery, um, such as the light switch, which was developed by Paul de Bevec. And um, I mean, it gets you really high quality data, but it's unlikely that this kind of technology will be used for the applications I was uh, mentioning before, which is consumer grade applications, applications that makes 
allows people to uh, digitize themselves to use NDR settings because you simply just don't have the uh, time and cost to capture every individual person in this way. So what we're building at Pinscreen is we're trying to think about a new way of um, digitizing humans, which is what you know. What's the easiest way? We want to make the digitization of humans as easy as taking a photo, a snap of yourself. And uh, we started to work on how do we take a photo of a person and create a convincing avatar. So now one of the issues that over the years we've learned is that it's really hard to ensure consistency of the input photo that you are uh, capturing from a person, right? So everyone takes a picture you know, at home or outdoors or is downloading some photos from the internet so people might smile, you might have occlusions, people might wear glasses, they don't wanna take it off. And the hardest thing is the lighting condition. How do you even ex explain to a consumer what is a good lighting condition? So one of the things that we've been working on recently is to use a uh, deep learning approach to make this possible. So let me uh, go back a little bit and talk a little bit about AI synthesis in general. And I guess everyone is familiar with what generative adversarial networks are. And we're taking this approach because we have seen that for photos, um, you know, over the past five, six, seven years, we've seen a tremendous um, progress um, for photos on generating very realistic humans, right? Faces that, you know, you've you know, probably seen style again too, that's basically you know, literally has you know almost no artifacts, and it you know we can only expect things to further improve again and again, right? And uh, it allows you to you know generate a new face of a person uh, from you know just random numbers, or it can even condition that and even have authoring capabilities. There's really a wide range of papers that allows you to do this. The only problem here is that everything is in two D. So what we've been working on recently is how can we make a 3D version of StyleGAN so that we can use this not only to generate a new face in 3D, but also to um, generate avatars that we can use. Now, this is a very difficult problem because if we have a clean input, it's, it's fine uh, because if the input is a person, let's say in a you know, good lighting condition, neutral face, front facing, um, you know, known uh, camera lenses, then we can solve this problem relatively easily. The only problem is once you get in the wild, once you have unconstrained data, then the amount of variation just explodes, right? If you look at the upper left image, I mean, it's even hard for a human to imagine what her actual skin tone is because you have all these crazy lighting conditions. And then the second thing is how do we make this, how do we make a generator become 3D? So that's actually, so to make it 3D, just imagine that instead of generating an image that has RGB colors, we're basically generating an, an image where each of the positions repre are represented by XYZ positions. In addition to that, if we have a parametric representation of humans, we can also at the same jointly generate a texture map. So it's important to have geometry and texture being generated together. Now, once you have this framework, there is still another problem, which is how do I even get the data to train that? I would have, I mean, images are easier because there's so many 2D images out there, but it's really hard to get uh, a large amount of normalized faces and their corresponding in the wild images with facial expressions. So that is the challenge that uh, we're doing. So this is a new work that we're, we're going to present at uh, CBPR this year. Um, so from this photograph, I can basically generate, um, you know, a neutral face of the person. That is the goal. And um, you can basically see that it can estimate the texture of the person and um, in a normalized way. So it's removing the facial expressions and it's removing the lighting condition of the person. 
So here's a video, but maybe I want to show you a, a live demo of how that looks like. Uh, let me just log in. So I'm going to stop my presentation real quick and let me just switch this to my other screen. Oh, can you enable the screen sharing for my uh, other Howl account? Thank you. Okay, so here you go. So you can see this is uh, our prototype system. I'm just going to digitize myself real quick. Let's see if it works. Right, so you can see now it's, it takes about like uh, 40, 50 seconds. And now I'm going to explain later what is, um, what is the compute. So it does the whole digitization in two steps. Um, the first step is um, the first step is the inference that happens very quickly. So it's like uh, probably just you know one or two seconds. And then once it has the rough shape of my face, it has an optimization step that deals with refine, refining my face to the input image. So in order to deal with this big, you know, this lack of large data, what we're trying to do is we're dividing this problem into two parts. The first part generates a rough look of my face. And the second one, the optimization basically tries to, um, tries to transfer the likeness from the input to the target. This transfer is using a perceptual loss. Oh, so you can see it's uh, recognized uh, I'm male. And uh, so the hair isn't exactly right, but it basically generated a normalized phase on my face from this, you know, lighting condition that I have here. Um, let me just show you one more example. Uh, I can show you a very extreme uh, example. So this is kind of extreme, um, this maybe. So you can see here that this guy, so this is, let me just recompute it so that it's not using the cached one. Um, so <clears throat> this example here, um, you can see uh, the person is doing a really crazy facial expression. And um, it um, can't basically normalize the face and also the highly contrasty lighting condition here and uh, try to generate, generate what it thinks is the best. So it takes about like 40 seconds. How does this always tend to converge to the same solution if you run it multiple times? Yes, I will show I will show that in a bit. So you will see that it will have very consistent, uh, reasonably consistent uh, results. Right? So yeah, we can see it recomputed has a different here. Um, that was uh, conversion on the different one. So this is basically the result. Can, oh, yes, I think. Um, oh, uh, the food. Okay, so actually, ah, I see. Um, okay, anyway, now you can see the <clears throat> zoom is actually taking over my screen. Okay, so let me switch back to um, to my presentation and then uh, move to the uh, evaluation of that. Um, let me just, okay, so you've seen, I can just skip that now. Okay. So what you can see here is um, this two-step approach, right? So we have an input image. The first uh, initialization is very fast. Uh, so that's a matter of one or two seconds. It generates um, um, the initial person. And then this optimization step refines the face, right? So you basically have this transfer of the likeness from the input to the target. So what it does is that in the second step, it uses the initial one as regularization and uses perceptual loss in order to optimize the likeness of the person. So um, getting back to your question on consistency. So here you can see examples of, you know, same subject uh, being captured under completely inconsistent uh, you know, footages and um, our solution having the ability to give a reasonable good estimation of a prediction of what the likeness is. 
This is when we have every frame being computed separately on a video. You can see it does change a little bit. It's not exactly the same, um, but you can still recognize the likeness of the person even if he has different facial expressions. Um, and this is uh, to showcase when we train jointly between geometry and uh, skin tone. You can see that even under these extreme lighting conditions, having the ability to, where generating every um, shape and texture separately for individual frames gives us uh, a decent uh, output, right? A decently consistent output. So this is just a comparison uh, with the current state of the art. So you can see Lee and coworkers, not my Lee, but uh, Lee with two E's. Um, you can see that the difference is the following. We're really solving a normalized avatar here where what other people do is they would sort of like, not really projecting the face onto uh, the mesh, but you do have a lot of, you know, specularities from the original image and smile and expressions that are baked into the texture. This is a problem when you want to use that inside a new real-time virtual environment. It becomes inconsistent and it becomes hard to animate it. So our approach is really to um, showcase how we can directly infer a neutralized face from an input image. So let me just show you a couple of more examples. You can see even from black and white images, uh, we can, you know, get a decent estimate of what the texture is. And, um, you know, even the ability to handle various lighting conditions. And this basically showcases how we can render these images under new lighting conditions, right? So a couple of extreme, you know, uh, input images, you can see highly inconsistent uh, input images, right? So some are more stylized, some are less stylized, but we can generate um, a decent consistent avatar from it. So this is where we see how, you know, sort of like are an important step for us to make this more accessible. And one thing that I've been showing a lot in the past is the ability to also use GANs to generate facial expression, right? So I'm pretty sure many of you have seen how we can generate facial, you know, plausible facial expressions from a single image, which basically tells us that, you know, not only can we render avatars in a CG environment, but we can potentially take that to the next level and use neural rendering to facilitate that. And that is a topic that is immediately connected to the problem of deep fakes, right? So uh, when, you have the, when you have a deep generative model that allows you to generate a realistic face, then you can also train it to uh, map from a person, the identity from one person to another while um, retaining the expressions and lighting condition of the source, which is exactly what uh, deep fake algorithms are doing using variational autoencoders. And one thing that people have shown obviously is that you can you know generate really, really convincing um, you know manipulations uh, of faces in videos and also you know you know um, have uh, the potential for misuse of this technology for various problems. And that's why at the same time we're also um, you know working on two, areas that I think is important. One is showcasing the ability of these kind of technologies to, you know, you know, to, to educate people um, that uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a potential problem if you can't really trust videos anymore. Uh, so this is a collaboration that we've been showing last year at the World Economic Forum to show how fast this uh, technology is advancing. So we developed the first real-time deepfake solution uh, where um, you can basically puppeteer another person where well, you could do face swapping in real time. Um, but at the same time, we're also looking at, at the good side. So uh, we recently did a collaboration with, um, you know, the, the rock band Travis. Um, and we basically turned Frank Healy into a younger version of himself using uh, variational autoencoders. So you can see uh, here's uh, something we've done. So on the left, you can see the young version and on the right, you can see the older version. So this is um, <clears throat> um, 
for his music video called Waving at the Window. So you can you can all watch it on YouTube. Let me play that. Right. So you can see <clears throat> this is sort of like a very so it's interesting. You don't have to necessarily do it for face swapping, but we, we do face swap him into uh, all his other band members. So that was sort of like you know an interesting uh, video we've been working at what we've been working on to uh, you know doing the lockdown phase where it's hard to reach people and uh, we really wanted to create this like um, you know uh, nice effect here. So what these neural rendering capabilities mean is that we have a lot of new uh, things we can do. Right, it doesn't have to be focused only on the face. Uh, you can use uh, an approach like uh, recycle GAN, right? Where you can basically take an entire region and map the facial expression from one person to another, but considering the entire area, right? So very similar to first order models where you can basically uh, map one entire frame to another person. So here's an example of that. Let me just play this real quick. ...and can also... Um have a very natural conversation with you. Uh, the second solution is our ability to generate a complete avatar. And from there's a lot of recent work. I think there's really an explosion of, of work where people are looking, how can we use the ability to you know, train your networks? Here with PyGAN, they're using a sort of like a neural radiance field, like a volumetric representation of the scene in order to re-render a person from a different view simply based on training, right? So really the, uh, the idea of completely removing any explicit 3D representation and just use data to train that. And one of the things we can see is that it gives you a really plausible result, right? And that's just with you know, some uh, unconstrained input data. Uh, here's another cool work. Um, I think it's from I think it's from Q Munich, uh, dynamic nurse, right? So uh, where you can see not only can you uh, map the face, but you can have full control over the whole head, right? So and it doesn't really require much of uh, internal representation. Uh, so that's one thing that's really interesting. Now the question is which one, yeah, I get this question a lot, like which one is better? Is it better to do neural rendering? Is it better to do CG? I mean, CG is kind of quite mature. We can sort of expect what's coming up in the next couple of years, but for neural rendering, it's a new field, right? It's um, a new application where people are exploring in all kinds of areas. Like, do I use a volumetric representation? Do I uh, use uh, some CG to drive it? Do I use lines? Do I, um, you know, is it like views that I'm trying to generate? But there is a fundamental problem, which is they all have something in common, which is they are, first of all, these neural networks are sometimes hard to train if you lack data. And the second thing is overall, it's, you don't have the same type of control you have with a computer graphics environment. So one thing that at Pinscreen we're mostly looking at, especially for the next couple of years, is this hybrid approach, right? We started to combine the use of neural rendering with, uh, for example, the Unreal Game Engine, actually also with Unity. And uh, the idea is that what our clients really need is this type of fine scale control, but they also wish to have the realistic look that you get with uh, neural renderers, right? So here's a demo of uh, our pagan, real-time pagan neural face rendering technology that um, showcases how we can take um, renderings from uh, the Unreal Engine uh, to uh, something that looks a lot more real using some footages of a person uh, trained into a deep model. So that's not exactly just using a uh, sort of like a deep fake la layer. Um, it has a couple of important things. The first thing is uh, it's real time. So it has to, uh, you know, work in real time so that we can build systems like virtual assistant. And the second thing is you need this, you need this, um, you need this uh, control from the CG scene. So you need it to work with all the lighting conditions and you need to be able to um, handle things like occlusions. And the nice thing is that in the CG environment, everything comes for free. So that's how we sort of like um, attach 
the new rendering layer and the uh, computer graphics layer. Let me play this video real quick and you can see it for yourself. Hi, this is Digital Mick, kind of the successor to Meet Mike. This is me driving this digital character in UE4 thanks to a persona rig from 3Lateral that's reading my expressions, feeding into a 3Lateral facial rig inside UE4. I also have on an XN suit to get my body motion. Now this is great, we love it, but as much fun as I am sitting here at the Modus Lab in Sydney, I can take this to the next level thanks to our friends at pin screen. So what do we do with this technology? So with this technology, where, for example, we're you know building all sorts of uh, solutions, and one of the nice application is really to um, impact the fashion industry. Um, so in we're actually uh, partnering with um, a company called Zozo. So they just got uh, well, they got acquired I think one or two years ago by Yahoo Japan for a billion for a few billion dollars, and they are sort of like the top um, online company in Japan for clothing. Um, and they want to go entirely virtual, right? Having uh, virtual fashion models instead of built ones. So we're sort of like starting to explore how do we create these kind of avatars at scale and how can we dress them using uh, virtual clothing, ultimately to solve the virtual triumph problem for um, every person. And that also includes the ability to drive facial expressions in real time. Um, and also have an integrated pipeline for performance capture. So you can actually, so we're doing some early tests and then also showcasing some of the um, avatars that we have. You can actually follow us on Instagram um, at uh, drip underscore virtual models, um, where you can see sort of like our recent developments. So we're basically showing a couple of images, but now we're going to push more on um, video content, which is one of the things that other traditional pure computer graphics pipeline, like um, people doing using the conventional CG pipeline are struggling, which is how to create these kind of content at scale. And one of the things that's really interesting is that we can generate many of these videos per week. Um, so that's sort of like one of these big advantages of that system. Now, at the same time, we're also um, working on fully autonomous humans. And that's where we see the future is, right? How people are going to interact with fully autonomous humans. And uh, we're not only working on the computer vision or the computer graphics aspect of it, we're also looking at the whole stack approach of AI and NLP. How do we parse someone's speech? How do we develop a chatbot as human-like? We're taking a very similar approach to OpenAI using these uh, deep generative language models. And how do we generate you know, convincing voice and from the voice, turn that into realistic behaviors, lip animations and gestures, right? We're really looking at the full stack solution of that. So one of the early tests that we've uh, presented last year was a uh, fun demo where we digitized my wife and uh, we created this demo that allows her to um, sort of just have some arbitrary con conversation. So in this video, nothing is scripted. Uh, it's completely random what she's saying, but she's giving a response. So she can never say twice the same thing. So we didn't program what she answers. And what's also interesting is we're using this combined CG and your rendering approach. And nothing is running on this MacBook Pro. It's all streamed in real time um, on the internet. So it sort of like has this like Twitch or live cam type of setting allowing us to create virtual humans in there. So let me show this real quick in case you haven't seen it. Start recording button, I can start interacting with her. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm good. I've been watching a lot of anime recently. What about you? Oh, really? Huh. Uh, I have been watching any uh, animes. Um, I've been working a lot lately. What do you do in your free time? My job is pretty boring. I just work online and browse. <laughs> uh, I'm well. My job is kind of interesting. Uh, we're actually uh, working on some state-of-the-art artificial intelligence technologies. You can, you can feel free to watch the whole video uh, on our website. Um, so for <clears throat> so we've seen basically how do we digitize avatars, how we can use mirror rendering to improve them, but then there's another set another category of digitization 
that I think is also very meaningful that we've actually seen in the uh, HoloLens concept video that is important for the purpose of communication. Those are harder to um, author or add animation to it. Not impossible, there are various papers that do that. But uh, one thing that they bring in is this live streaming ability in 3D, right? So I guess you guys have probably uh, are familiar with, you know, um, holoportation systems developed by Microsoft a couple of years ago. And here's a recent video where they're showing this in connection with HoloLens 2, right? The ability to stream another person from one place to another. So this video is a, you know, sort of like a concept video as well. So uh, these are playbacks of video uh, of people and not stream in real time, but it's possible, right? So here's a um, video from a couple of years ago showcasing their holoportation system. And to make this possible, you need to put like a lot of cameras around the person in this specialized room, capture room. And it is, it consists of like machine vision cameras, structural light cameras, all combined in order to sort of like scan your body in real time so that you can digitize it, fuse it to get a mesh with texture, allowing you to stream, you know, remotely. Now, there are other companies doing this. Here's an example from Evercoast. They're using a combination of, you know, different Intel RealSense uh, cameras to, you know, get a point cloud of the person. But again, you need this like sort of, uh, you know, green screen room for good, uh, you know, background removal. Uh, but most importantly, you need like a 360 surround of cameras to capture your entire body. Now, the main issue here is, and that's, that's a question I always wondered, like, you know, when I was watching Star Wars, it's like, how the hell did they, how the hell did they capture Princess Leia from, from, from one place to another? Uh, I, I don't think she was in a capture room. Um, and at most, uh, you have probably R2D2 seeing her from one view. So we started to wonder, to, to ask about that question a couple of years ago, when we started to work on um, a technology allowing you to use a single camera to capture the entire person, right? And that was sort of like our early work called PIFU, right? Stands for Pixel Implicit, uh, Pixel Aligned Implicit Function. It's a collaboration between USC, Waseda, and uh, UC Berkeley. And what we tried to do is basically digitize an entire person from a single photo. So I took this picture of myself in Sydney with my friend, Mike Seymour, and then we use you know, standard semantic segmentation to remove the background and then use a new representation that allows us to get reasonable digitization in 3D, like a rough mesh of the person, including the texture. Now, how do we do that, right? So the classic approach you can think of, well, I just have a volume, a volume and then for each volume I have occupancy, but this is too low res, right? It doesn't give you the kind of detail that you see here because of the memory requirements. So one of the first thing that we did was we started to look into the problem of what is the right data representation for that. And there were two important things. The first thing is to use an implicit function instead of an explicit volumetric representation. And the second thing was encoding a person globally into one feature vector was a big problem. It didn't allow us to um, handle, you know, the wide variation of subject inside it and get all the details. So what we did was we sort of enforced the internal representation to be compatible with the input resolution. And uh, what we did is like per pixel, we have an independent feature vector that still takes into account the um, global context of the content. So that's what we meant with pixel aligned. And there are a couple of new NERF papers uh, from other groups uh, from, uh, that are sort of exploring uh, this, kind of, this type of approach, allowing you to um, generate high quality uh, 3D content with actually limited amount of training data. So I think for this work, there were only a couple of hundred of subjects used for training, but you can see that you can get pretty convincing 3D models from a single photo of the person, including the clothing, including props. And what is kind of surprising if you put two person, it even works with two person at the same time. The only limitation here is that it, that original paper, it took like you know, roughly a minute to generate a single frame. So there's no way you can use this for any real-time application. So one thing we uh, have shown um, last year, we published that last year's ECCV 
uh, as well as demonstrated at SIGGRAPH Real-Time Live, where we won this, uh, you know, Best in Show Award, was the ability to make this real-time. And the approach consists of using, so the system consists of a you know, simple Logitech webcam, nothing else. On the right, you can see the digitization happening in real time. There's very small lag there. And uh, the whole person is in 3D with textures in the back and in the front, right? I'm gonna show the back in a little bit. And the approach here consists of using an octree type of representation combined with some um, engineering to parallelize the uh, inference using deep neural networks. So here you can see in this video, where the person is rotating and you can actually see the inference in uh, 3D, right? So he is uh, rotating and you can see the full inference in 3D. So here we also show uh, not only a display, but we can even stream that over Wi-Fi and use a sort of like a really basic AR application to, from the viewer, he can basically turn around the subject and see uh, the other person fully in 3D. So that's sort of like, you know, a first step approach for us for a future that, you know, we've seen a lot in science fiction movies like Blade Runner 2049. We have sort of like this whole graphic display of a person and how do we, you know, how could we even digitize a person? How can we create intelligent avatars that look real? Um, we're still, you know, I think a little bit away from that. But I do see this future being possible, except that here you, we don't have the holographic technology yet. However, I'm kind of optimistic. So I, you know, there's some really cool work from Brigham Young University that was uh, published at Nature uh, not too long ago, where they're showcasing some, you know, early uh, capabilities where you can use lasers and particles to sort of draw in real time. Um, you know, a graphical rendering of, um, you know, 3D um, objects, right? So this little butterfly that you can make it uh, float. So these are uh, really promising technologies for, you know, future where holograms may be possible. And, but I still think that first, what's going to happen is we're probably first going to see AR and VR devices becoming mainstream. I think that they are likely to become mainstream um, in the next five to 10 years, uh, where and mainstream means that, you know, every person at home has one of these devices and uh, you have the ability to, you know, sort of have um, this sort of like 3D immersive experience with a really good form factor of uh, sort of like these kind of headsets. And when you ask me what I think about uh, neural rendering versus CG, I think there's a huge potential for neural representation. Here's a recent uh, work that uh, we have done with uh, UC Berkeley, uh, uh, with uh, Alex Yu as co-author, uh, as first author. Uh, it's a technology called planoptries. I'm pretty sure many of you have heard of the explosion of papers of NERFs, neural, re neural uh, radiance fields uh, that was published first last year. And one of the things that we're showcasing here is how do we make it real time, right? And uh, the problem with nerves is that um, the traditional nerves, is, I mean, the good thing about nerves is that you can directly encode entire scenes, very complex objects using just images, calibrated images. Um, but then the problem is, and you can have view dependent effects and everything, right? It really looks like the real thing. The only problem is that it takes very long to render it because of the amount of sampling that's required. So here we're basically showing how you can use octrees to have a more effective representation combined with spherical harmonics that are used to um, encode the view dependent effects. So um, that's sort of like, a, you know, a showcase how we can make these kind of renderings. I think this will also play an important role for digital humans as well. Um, and, you know, I mean, you can do entire scenes. So the reason why I think this is really um, promising is because the problem with AR and VR headsets, I think is you have limited content, not in terms of like games or uh, this and that, but it's for real sixth degree of freedom, you need, right now you need a game engine to run it. So the production cost is very high. For uh, practical capture, you're limited by 360 degree of freedom. So 
the, the only option, I think that what's really promising is either these kind of uh, neural rendering approaches for NERS or MPIs um, that can be used to, uh, you know, sort of like better encode entire scenes from actual captures, but it allows you to have the sixth degree of freedom motion, right? So imagine if in the future I want to, before I buy something, instead of looking on the website, I can actually see it in 3D and have a realistic representation. So I think there's a lot of uh, potential for these kind of technologies. Um, so with that, I'd like to conclude my talk and uh, I'm happy to take questions and thank you for listening. Thank you, Hal, for this exciting talk. This was amazing. Lots of super innovative technology and I can see a bright future coming up uh, with all the technologies that you at Pinscreen and others develop. I think we can have a few questions now. Uh, let me start with one I found very intriguing. You showed this comparison when you created these avatars from single image um, and you convincingly showed that your approach uh, is much better at removing the illumination and not baking it into the texture so that you can actually do relighting, etc. But one of the shortcomings I found compared to the baseline approaches that seem to more directly fit to the observation, one distinction was that in your approach, you can no longer really recognize these celebrities. And I think this is an aspect that's often critical when, when you want to reproduce a celebrity, you want people to be able to recognize it. And that seemed to me a little bit less so in, in your approach. Do, do you see where that could come from and how you can maybe alleviate this, this issue? Yeah, yeah. So it's actually quite clear where that comes from. So um, <clears throat> the uh, problem is the lack, of, the lack of data that we're using. Um, uh, for training that system. Um, because in order to train uh, this type of inference, we use, uh, we can only use data where we have um, normalized subjects and um, uh, their corresponding ground truth input image. So in order to improve that, uh, we just have to increase that. Um, you can see that those subjects that we use for training people that look similar or even those type of subject, it works perfectly. But then for um, people that weren't part of the data, then uh, you just have, you have to rely on the perceptual, uh, um, the perceptual transfer. But then the perceptual transfer um, also is trained with more data, but then it has uh, more difficulties when your input comes from a wide uh, range of input. But I still think that this approach is um, the right one because um, we have done exper exper experiments in the past with trying to neutralize data. And um, you know, the other approach is basically you take an input photo and try to neutralize that and then use the conventional approach of fitting to the inputs. But then the neutralization doesn't, it's, it's harder to deal with um, generating a high quality input. You might get the likeness of the person, but then you have things that are broken. So this is like when you start from two ways, but looking at how StyleGAN 2, these kind of like style, these, not StyleGAN, but like just GAN approaches improve in 2D, I think the strategically, I think the right approach is basically to do this. I totally agree. Obviously, you do want to model 3D and you want to kind of deploy the power of GANs in, in, in 3D space to, to be able to model geometry and lighting and all that. And I, I totally see. I, I'm pretty sure it's just a matter of time to get all the details back so that you can recognize the celebrities in 3D as well. Yeah. Um, I think we have a couple of questions also from YouTube or maybe live questions, if anyone has a question. Bjorn, I think you have a question. Yes, uh, thanks a lot for this amazing talk. I really enjoyed it and the videos and all the visualizations were super cool. And um, I have a question concerning the avatars that you create. So um, when I like 
meet with people online and they have super realistic avatars. That, of course, helps to have a more um, immersive feeling, visually at least. But when I meet with people online, and uh, not online, in, in real life, I have more to it, right? There are more senses that I can actually um, feel, like the smell or when I lift something for physical interactions. Um, and how do you think thus this, thus this um, these additional senses uh, limit the immersiveness for in, in the future for, for developing these um, online meetings, let's say? Right. So maybe your question is, how important are other sensors um, uh, with respect to visual ones, pure visual ones, right? Yeah, basically, like how important are other yeah. senses to have a better, more immersive yeah. feeling and how do they um, limit um, that? Because I, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult to um, model something like, for example, let's say, you want to lift a rock. Um, right. It's hard to do that virtually, right? Because right. there is no weight to it somehow. Right, right, right. That's true. So I, 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 see the, I see the question. So first of all, I think there's still work to do on the visual aspect of it and also on simulating these things. Um, but I think there's also a perceptual aspect of it, which is um, tightly connected to how... I mean, our senses are just like visual, audio, you know, touching, et cetera. There are actually um, startups like uh, Emerge.io that is, you know, sort of like experimenting with touch uh, in an immersive space. You can uh, feel free to check it out. Um, there's also companies that are building gloves for people to touch things. I think this is uh, application specific. Uh, so it depends on what we're doing. Like if we're fine with Zoom, then the visual aspect is fine, right? You probably just need to enhance a bit the quality of the avatars. But if it's like a task that requires people to perform something and touch is essential, then, or you know, lifting something is essential, then the question is, do you really need the weight or do you need to have the perception of the weight? If the perception is important, then probably the uh, animation or the visual representation of that is important. Um, yeah, so I think, I think, yeah, so to assess these kind of problems, I think you need to look at it from a perceptual standpoint, what the specific task is. Um, I mean, if you think about AR and VR, all these immersive things, I mean, they, um, they start, I mean, they're not being used massively in the mainstream, but they are deployed in places where they are almost critical, right? For example, for um, automotive, uh, for manufacturing, for health, for defense, right? I mean, if you, there's like this billion dollar, two, two billion dollar deal between Microsoft and, and the, uh, with the military in the US. And uh, they're basically building things that solve an actual problem. And maybe, maybe virtual, you know, Virtual humans probably play a role for certain training scenarios, but not necessarily for everything. Thank you, Hao. I think we're going to offer, offer the floor to some of the questions from our YouTube audience. Uh, Lucas, if you would yeah. read. Oh, thank you very much for the talk. It was super interesting, and especially the live demo was, was amazing. Uh, the first question from YouTube is from Juan Raul Padron Griffe, and he asks, what do you think is the most challenging aspect of immersive concerts? Photorealism, spatial sound, crowd simulation, or realistic movements? I think, um, I don't think it's, I think the problem, okay, so for virtual concerts, the big problem is this. How do you capture the um, celebrity without being uh, obtrusive? So first of all, ideally what people would want to do is they want to be able to do virtual concerts from home without going to a studio for capture. Celebrities certainly don't want to wear a mocap suit, especially because it's a physical performance, dance. All these things are limited by 
by mocap suits. Now, if you're wearing a, if you're holding a guitar, uh, or if you're doing really, you can't wear a mocap suit, right? So these are only for offline productions and special effects. For real-time things, they're really not designed for you to do that. I think the main problem is how, the main question is how do you capture the look and the performance? So I think volumetric capture makes a lot of sense uh, to do that. But then, um, well, volumetric capture, you need basically volumetric capture in a way that you can not need a studio because you're not gonna fly everyone to a studio. Um, you need, this has to work from home with a basic setting and you need the ability to, um, and you need the ability to stream that and also put people inside a new virtual environment. So this relighting aspect is important. It's basically, you know, uh, going back to this, you know, avatar digitization that we were showing, this is the problem that you can't really get when you try to this is the reason why this consistent avatar is so important. It's almost more important than the quality of it because even if you have like, you stick the texture, your texture onto a person's face, it's just going to look like crap if every avatar looks different. It just looks inconsistent. You don't, it doesn't look like it's created by an artist. That's why when you play video games, um, like, you know, whatever, uh, you may not have the, you may not have uh, photoreal avatars, especially for mobile video games. I mean, they look okay, but it doesn't bother you when you play them. It doesn't, it, it, because it's consistently th that quality, the entire world looks, you know, when you play, I don't know, um, video games like sports games, I mean, the faces don't look like meta humans, but it doesn't bother you because the gameplay is important. But what would bother you is if you actually stick a photo of the person onto it, it just looked like South Park. Right? Not uh, South Park is great, but it's just a different style. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the answer. There's another question from Jin Long Yang, and he asks: In the work of 3D Style Gan, is it possible to disentangle facial skin color and lighting conditions from a single image? What assumption has been made about the lighting conditions? Uh, you want. Why would you want to dis? Well, I don't think you want to disentangle the skin tone from the jump. I mean, you could. You can just train them separately. Uh, but I think you know. You, I think you want. To, I mean, we, we what we do is we jointly train them. The skin tone. You want to disentangle the skin tone and the lighting. Um, that's. I think that's what we want, but not the skin tone and the, the geometry. It's just like black and white images. If you have black and white images, you want the likeness, the appearance of the person to give you a plausible explanation of what the skin tone is. And all these methods that, that turn black and white to uh, colors, I mean, they work amazingly well, right? I mean, they can tell, I mean, it might not be 100% accurate, but it gives you a plausible explanation that looks good, yeah. I would have a, Another question, you've been very much focused on humans, avatars for humans, and you've shown amazing results in, in generating 3D humans and, and textures and lighting in a very realistic way, often just from one single image. To what extent do these techniques that you've been developing generalize to other types of um, say animals, for example, could you, could you do the same for monkeys? Could you do the same for cats and dogs, for horses, for whatever? Or would you have to start from scratch again? Is, is there something that let's say that you've learned on humans that would immediately transfer to other classes of, of say objects? Yeah, I think it's a matter of data. I think um, uh, the work uh, Pygen actually shows it quite well that it just, you can, they have like examples with cats. Right, um, and even and sometimes it's actually easier uh, because uh, we are less sensitive to the difference between uh, different animals and humans. Um, and uh, the uh, what what the difference is actually a bit different, right? So with animals, they have textures, uh, texture patterns, uh, you know, on their fur that could like a zebra and the horse. Um, but I think what's um, these uh, generative models have shown is that 
they, I think they can handle those, right? It's just a matter of data. Um, and I mean, I would love to have a version with my, with our, our three dogs uh, in it. Um, but I think the main issue with animals is just in terms of driver app. I mean, it's really like a really cool and fun project. Uh, but in some ways, our technologies are driven by applications and by clients. So yeah, there's less of the, a market for cats. That's the, that's the, <laughs> maybe no, maybe there is. Maybe there's, I'm, I'm sure there is <laughs> uh, for cats and dogs. Yeah, but yeah. I think that, um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, Howley. This was really great, uh, the presentation. And you know, I think this was by definitely the first ever presentation on YouTube with with live demo included. I mean, amazing, really. Thank you, thank you. And uh, and also thank you so much, everyone, for joining and for the Q and A. And I think that would conclude the live stream.